Okay, so we're going to get started. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, for coming uh, this evening. Uh, I, I think this event turned out to be extremely timely. There's been a lot of uh, activity in the state legislature legislature over the last couple of days. Uh, there was a pretty exciting uh, board meeting that Deborah will fill us in on. Um, so I'm going to just get you started with some orientation and some uh, libertarian oriented recommendations for what to do uh, with BART and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Deborah to do uh, most of the speaking uh, tonight. My name is Mark Jaffe, I'm with the Cato Institute, I live in this building, I've lived in Contra Costa County for 10 years, I've lived in the Bay Area for 20, I've used BART quite a lot. Um, I really want BART to succeed, I think I have some ideas that are a bit beyond the uh, Overton window right now, but hopefully uh, when you hear them and you think they're reasonable, you'll discuss them with your friends and maybe uh, they'll get into the Overton window. So I want to start by giving you uh, sort of the, the status, which is this is the BART ridership annually going back to 1998. This is just downloaded from BART's site and I, I basically just tabulated all the information and put it onto an attractive chart. The thing I want you to take away from this is that ridership peaked in the mid 2010s. It didn't peak in 2019. It was already on the way down in 2000, by 2019. And then of course it cratered and now it's gradually coming back. And I think this is a very important point because we are in a secular decline of mass transit utilization. People want the convenience of you know, going point to point with their own vehicle using you know, Uber or Lyft, um, biking, you know, whatever. So I think the idea that we're ever going to get back to 400,000 weekday riders is really uh, fantastical. And I think that's an important takeaway for understanding you know, what our policy should be around, uh, you know, BART's recovery. So I had a piece in the uh, East Bay Times a few weeks ago. Uh, Deborah had one today, so it's very timely. Um, here are my four recommendations, and I'm going to go through these in, uh, in, in more detail. So first, uh, I think BART has taken a really positive step by posting a code of conduct on all of the new cars. I, I, I've never seen one of these on the old cars, but I, this is something that, coming from New York, I remember when the New York subway started to turn around in the 90s under uh, Giuliani. This was something that we had. We established that there are certain behaviors that are not acceptable on public transit because we want people to actually ride public transit and they're not going to ride public transit if they're being made uncomfortable by people exhibiting antisocial behavior. Now, uh, for the libertarians in the audience, I, I want to just sort of parse this a little. Um, some libertarians take the view that anything that's in the public space, there should really be no government restrictions on personal behavior. So you could do, you, if you want to take drugs, you know, take drugs on board. I am a libertarian who does not believe that. I think we should think about BART as if it's a private space because we want people to ride it. And so in a private space, like I'm all for drug legalization, I don't want people coming into my house and uh, shooting up. I don't want that, and I think most, I, probably most everybody here doesn't want that. And I think we should think about this as a space that we're sharing with our neighbors, and we want certain standards of, of conduct. So <laughs> that's my, uh, you know, that's how I reconcile uh, some of these ideas with, uh, you know, my ideology. So I think this is a good list, but it really is insufficient. I, I would suggest adding smoking, drug use. I've seen personally riding back to people rolling out the aluminum foil and it was meth or whatever. I don't want to see that. And I was frankly, I was scared that they were going to light the, the car up. I mean, it's just totally unacceptable that people would do that. I think it's really interesting. We have vending without a permit. So in vending, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> Someone's coming down. Uh, okay. No, we'll, just, we'll let them in. Okay, so um, so we have vending without a, uh, vending without a permit, right? But we don't have anything against panhandling. Well, vending, you're trying to get money from somebody, right? 
panhandling, you're trying to get money from somebody, and there's no per and you don't have a permit because, as far as I know, there are no panhandling permits. So I think it's very interesting, you know, that the progressives on the bar board want to, you know, ban people from conducting business, but they don't want to stop people from making you feel guilty about not giving them money. So I think panhandling needs to be there. Occupying multiple seats, you know, what's that? How many people have seen that when you get on board, right? And they're man spreading, right? <laughs> totally unacceptable, right? Uh, should be displayed at the entrance to BART, not just on the car. So you're making a contract when you go through that fair gate, you understand that these are the rules. And obviously, it has to be um, enforced. And I'm sure Deborah will talk a lot about policing on, on BART. Um, this one is uh, very controversial. Uh, when I rolled this out, I've seen a lot of you know, negativity from the uh, pro-transit people. But it's really, really obvious. So in Vancouver, this is a, this is a train in Vancouver. There is no operator, OK? Here we have the BART connector from Coliseum to OIK, Oakland Airport. No operator, OK? We, you know, this is, uh, I think, a big area of, di of dispute between people who observe BART. I, I'm a believer in the, uh, the, the transit activist view that you have to have very frequent service to attract people. Because a big negative is, you get to the station and you see you know, next train 20 minutes or 25 minutes. That turns you off from riding. If it's five or four or three, then it's like, okay, I'm gonna make this, I'm gonna get into the habit of coming here and, and, you know, and using it. So that's, I think you know, that really having frequent service all, throughout the entire day, not just the rush hour, is really important. But operators are very expensive and in fact there's a shortage of them. A lot of dark trains get canceled because they can't find operators. So we really need to develop the technology to, uh, to have uh, driverless trains. Now I think there's a couple of things that need to happen there. First of all, uh, platform doors. You'll see that at, uh, when you take the, uh, the bar connector. So there's, there's two doors that open simultaneously. There's the door on the train itself, and there's a door on the platform, so that promotes safety. And then while BART was originally designed to be um, an automated system, it's very antiquated. So a lot of that technology is going to have to be uh, <coughs> updated to be able to support this type of thing. But I, th I would submit to you that if we have X amount of capital money, it should be spent on making existing tracks driverless, as opposed to adding new tracks that aren't going to get adequate ridership. And I'll get to that point in a minute. Um, so right now, BART is spending about $30 million a year on other post-employment benefits, which are mainly retiree health benefits. As uh, many of you who are involved in the Taxpayers Association know, our pension team worked on this issue, and we pointed out that most people who are retiring on a moderate pension would qualify uh, for the uh, Covered California, what's called the Obamacare Exchange. So it's not like we're saying, hey, BART employee, when you retire at 55 or 56 or 57, you're not going to get any help at all with your health coverage. But you should be you know, using the same programs that, that the general public uses. And I think you know, if you're in the private sector, it's really, really unusual to get employee, you know, uh, retiree health coverage. So this is, a, this is, I think, a luxury that BART can no longer afford. Uh, unlike pensions, it's not legally protected by the California rule. And honestly, I really think this needs to be on the, on the chopping block. Um, stop spending money on unnecessary activities. So uh, some of us on, uh, on Twitter <laughs> were having fun with the BART mascots. These are anime mascots. They went to an anime convention to get young people to ride BART. I can't imagine this really moves the needle on ridership very much at all. Um, here we have the Office of Civil Rights. This is a screen capture from there. I think they're trying to be you know, really multicultural, trying to you know, get different people from different cultures interested in BART. To me, this is like really superfluous when BART has multi-hundred million dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. We should really be focusing on the core issue of moving people from their origin to their destination and not doing all these superfluous things. The main one of which is working on all of the unnecessary extensions. And there are 
you know, two on BART right now, as well as one uh, that's being um, developed for Caltrain. The, um, uh, the main one that you see a lot of information on right now is the, um, the BART extension in San Jose. That actually is uh, not owned by BART, it's owned by the Valley Transportation Authority, but it will be operated by BART. Uh, it's going to cost $9.3 billion. It's going to be finished in 2034. It's going to be done in 2014, because it was a year after I graduated law school. I was waiting for it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think that was supposed to be done in 2020. So, <laughs> so 2034 plus, 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 right? <laughs> and the ridership, uh, right now, the uh, Federal uh, Trans uh, Transit Administration estimates 32,900 uh, 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 additional riders by 2040. But in fact, uh, 20,000 of those 30,000 will be converting from other modes. So they're not even going to take very many cars off the road at all. So it's, for $9 billion, it's just like a, a not really uh, uh, a good use of money. But let's talk about BART, what BART is specifically doing. So BART has spent, or is in the process of spending $200 million right, to plan a second tunnel between San Francisco and Oakland. The first tunnel is not full. As I showed you, ridership already started going down in the late uh, 20 teens, and now um, it's cratered. And another important thing about ridership is that it used to be that it, there was a really strong peaks at eight, between eight and nine o'clock, and between five and six o'clock. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. The ridership is now dispersed throughout the day, so we're not gonna really have a situation where the tunnel is going to get filled, you know, at any particular time. And the reason that this is uh, going off, I'm sorry, is people are still coming. So, <laughs> sorry about that. So, um, yeah. So this this tunnel, this additional tunnel, really seems very really unnecessary. And yet, we're spending time and money. And I'm sure Deborah's spent a lot of time on the board board hearing reports about this and discussing this. It's just uh, really, you know, uh, it's distracting from, the, again, the main goal of just getting people from here to there. One other point I want to make about this is that uh, this is the second of two projects to improve capacity um, in, the, in BART's core between Oakland and, and uh, San Francisco. They're, they're already spending hundreds of millions of federal and uh, local taxpayer dollars to change the signaling system on the current tunnel. Right now, the current tunnel has a max of 22 trains. It will go up to 28 trains by 2030 as a result of this. So not only do we never use up the 22 train capacity, not only are we going down, but we're going to have a, a, about a 25% increase in capacity without doing this project. So pretty crazy. So uh, unfortunately, our second speaker, uh, Lawrence McQuillan, couldn't be with us today because um, of, a, of a health issue. So I just wanted to quickly uh, go over uh, some of his ideas before turning over uh, to Deborah. So the Independent Institute issued a report in January 2022, and they called for these uh, steps, including ending government subsidies to BART, selling BART to a private for-profit company, um, allowing transportation alternatives, and uh, not doing expansions. So, okay, so I definitely agree with not doing expansions. Um, I definitely agree with transportation alternatives not too excited about the first two. Now again, you know, uh, for those of us who are you know, with the Libertarian Party, we know that you know, having things being private as opposed to being government run is best practice. So normally by default we advocate privatization. The problem here is that if you just privatize it the way the independence do wants, you basically will end BART. And you know, I, while I'm trying to move the Overton window, I don't think we can move the Overton window that, that far. I think most people in the Bay Area see BART as an essential service, even if they <coughs> don't personally use it. And so I think you know, we need to go a little lighter on some of these um, <laughs> radical libertarian ideas. Uh, to, to drive this point home to you, um, I did some work with uh, the BART budget, which um, <laughs> uh, Deborah tried to modify, but unfortunately was approved uh, in its current form. These are rough estimates on my part, um, but I believe that based on my understanding of um, BART's uh, comeback plan, they would, would be expecting about 55.4 million riders in the next uh, fiscal year, and that's 
probably give or take a million or two, and that means these um, uh, quotients at the end uh, may be slightly off, but I think they're directionally correct. So the fair revenue would work out to just over four dollars per writer, and that makes sense, right? Because you know, while we might spend six or seven dollars to go into downtown San Francisco from here, a lot of people are just within San Francisco, and then there are a lot of people who are getting discounted fares, right? Because they're seniors or they're um, uh, children or whatever. So I think this number is about right. But the, to the, the operating expenses for BART next year at $933 million work out to almost $17 a rider. Now, can you imagine raising the average fare of BART to $17? No one would ride it. Like, everyone would drive it. They would take lifts and basically kill it off. I always like to include this because um, uh, transit you know, analysts usually just look at operating expenses when they think about per passenger costs. That's, that doesn't work. You have to include capital expenses as well because if you don't invest in capital, if you don't maintain the tracks and the trains and so forth, the system's gonna break down. So you really should also include all the other spending and that works out to an additional 272. So you're getting close to $20, right? Per passenger to operate BART. And this is a big improvement from 2021, right? It was more like 30 or 40 back then. So the ridership recovery is definitely you know, improving this. Um, Mark, why, yeah. is, why is fares not a revenue item? Why is it added up in the expenses? It's not. I'm just. It's separate. It's just a separate thing. Okay. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. This is not a. This. Uh, this number is the total of these two. I see. Yeah. So um, that's all I had. I'm going to turn it over to Deborah right now. Um, we have. Uh, oh, wait a second. Let me just hit this real quickly because. Um, uh, this is part of the independence to think about the uh, uh, alternatives. I think you know bike share, and this is an example of bike share in San Francisco is a really great idea. I think it would help us have it, have it in Walnut Creek. I'm getting to the point where I'm a little bit afraid to take a bicycle. I wouldn't mind taking this. This is an electric tricycle. These are becoming these are becoming really popular for like touring around Napa. So if we could have shares with these, I think that would be very, uh, very attractive. And so now without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Deborah. We need about a minute or two to do a bit of a slight change here. So just give me a, give me a moment. Thank you. It's been a really busy time for BART, and I, before I go into my BART stuff, I just want to say, Mark, I was in Omaha, Nebraska last weekend, yes. and I had the opportunity to do that e-bike, yeah. and it was awesome, and I had no problem doing it, and we rode all along the Missouri River, and we had really a fantastic time, so don't be afraid of the e-bike. No training wheels. No training okay. wheels. <laughs> They're really easy, uh, really easy to use. I love it. So. Um, Somewhere I have photos that are going to get shared at some point. Uh, well, well, thank you. As you all know, I'm, I, I, I am the board director for San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit. Elected first in 2016, re-elected in 2020. There are nine board directors that govern the agency. And yes, we are elected by the voters, believe it or not. And, and so often on the presentations to large groups, and they'll go, I didn't know we elected BART board directors. <laughs> that is part of the problem, okay? And so part of my mission has been over the last several years to really elevate that issue to the public and make them understand that you're electing us, okay? And if you don't like the way BART operates, you should be really focusing on who you elect to these positions. So um, I will just kind of dive right in. Uh, I'm gonna focus mo mostly on financial stuff and I may actually uh, 
uh, inject a little different opinion into that last slide that Mark put up on the, on the finances. Um, but we'll have plenty of time for Q&A afterward. Hopefully this won't take, you know, more than three hours. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> like a meeting. Yeah. Um, so if you don't know anything about me, I started my career as a CPA right out of college. We were right into KPMG, San Francisco group, and I was there for about five years and then went off into the private sector. I was a ended as a chief financial officer for uh, a medium-sized construction company just down the street here, WE Lions Construction. Uh, when the uh, recession hit, um, we were commercial contractors. It was about 2010 that everything just sort of came to a halt and we ran off all our backlog. My partner and I split up on that business and I went off to just find myself. <laughs> and I'm not sure how I ended up here, but I did. <laughs> There's a whole lot in between that, but I won't go into that. Um, so um, let's, let's just kind of jump, jump ahead here. I'm going to start, you saw the slides that Mark did, and he has a very good ridership slide. Uh, we may need to tra trade some slides there, Mark. Uh, but um, I'm going to show you ridership in a little different way. This is February of 2020, right before the pandemic hit. Okay, We call this 100%. And everything that BART does now, they put out numbers, they're very focused on ridership, which I will tell you is the wrong approach. But that's because I come out of the CPA industry. Um, but they're focused on ridership, and every time they issue a number and they say, we're at 39% of pre-pandemic, we're starting here at 100%. On March 16th, the shelter in place began, we immediately dropped to 41% of this, in, uh, of the previous year, in ridership, okay? In my April of 2020, we carried 6% of our previous ridership, okay? It was a ghost town at part. And, you know, of course, this is paid, but all these numbers are paid ridership, and we all know a lot of people do not. <laughs> So, um, so this is how it went through time. We cut service hours. This is important. In April 2020, we cut service hours by 50%. We started running only 50% of the trains that we ran before. In September 21, we, we were up around, in June of 21, we were up around 20%. September of that year, we returned to almost full service running almost the same number of trains, it's like 95%. And by December we, of 21, we hit 28%, and we just sort of slowly bounced up a little bit as we go. Uh, this is actually September, 40% in September of 2022. And then we dropped off in December. Um, now, we always have a drop in ridership in December, but remember, these are comparing to 2019. So this was really, um, this really, we can only say is it was a result of more viruses, people getting sick, and people getting worried about COVID again. March, we were at 39%. Today, uh, if I have to guess at what the June numbers will come in at, it's going to be about 41% of pre-pandemic. So you can see during this time, we're really just sort of flat. And we're, the projections, as Mark said, even BART is not projecting a return to ridership uh, ever to preach pandemic levels until way out. And that's really impossible to project. I mean, they're out 10 years and they're not reaching pre-pandemic levels. So, um, but what did the budgets do? This is what's important. This is what I talk a lot about wrote an opinion piece, as, as Mark said, came out this morning in the East Bay Times um, regarding all this finance stuff. Um, here's what the budgets did. The red is our operating budget. And by the way, I do want to stop and clarify, there are two separate budgets at BART. There is a capital budget and an operating budget. And the slide you showed, Mark, actually was our operating budget. And there's a little bit of allocations in that operating budget to capital. But this is what we spend each year in the capital budget, and it's well, you know, this is 19, it was 1.3 billion per year, okay? Um, so our capital budget has historically exceeded our operating budget. 
But if you look at the operating budget, you know, we're just, this is the $1 billion mark, this line. And you can see that pre-pandemic in 19, we we're at 922, <coughs> went to 947, dipped 30 million in uh, 2021, which was really the heart of the pandemic. And these are fiscal years, July 1st to June 30th. Um, and then we're right back up to a billion 19. Uh, this is the FY23 budget, a billion 17. What we just passed last week, a billion 84, 1.186. Okay, it just keeps. There, there was no real, cons, you know, considerable dip, even though we were running 55% of the trains. And <coughs> Bart says that's because fixed costs. Now, how many people in the room do I have are finance, like savvy accounting people? There's a few, I know some of you. Okay, fixed costs. Look, I took a whole class in college 30 plus years ago on cost accounting, and it was all about fixed versus variable costs. Bart claims he can't change these budgets because, well, all of our costs are fixed. And for those of you who studied it, Tom's shaking his head, yeah. That's nonsense, okay? <laughs> That's just nonsense. Because it wasn't fixed costs when you go back to 2010, like Mark's chart showed you, and the ridership revenue was going up and up and up, and those costs, if I ran this chart all the way back, those costs were going up and up and up and up, right along with that ridership. Okay, so how can you say they're fixed costs? Okay, this is what I recently <coughs> put together um, I put this out on Twitter a few times. It actually uh, blows the heads of some of the bar people when I do this. Um, but what we really have here, I have a pointer on this thing, I think. Oh, that is <laughs> No, that doesn't work. Okay. What we have here is, this is starting with fiscal year 19. I'm sorry, these are really small at the bottom. But each one of these red bars represents the operating expense of BART in each fiscal year, starting with fiscal year 2019. Now this is the year ended June 30th of 2019. This is actual, fiscal year 20 actual, these are actual <laughs> expenditures, not budgets. <coughs> okay. This is 2021's actual, 2022's actual, 2022's actual, Projected FY23, which you know ends in two weeks. This is the best projection <coughs> I could get. What we passed in our budget 24, budget 25, and these are the forecasts for 26, 27, and 28. Okay, you notice anything about those red bars? <laughs> it does keep going up. Okay, mm -hmm. now behind this in green is the operating revenue for each of those years. <coughs> okay. This is where the pandemic hit, right in here. First, you know, 2020, 21 was the first full year of the pandemic. And this is the rate at which that revenue has gone up. Now, operating revenue is mostly rider revenue, but it does include some of the other things, like we have some advertising revenue and some, some you know, they always claim that we get money from these uh, developments of parking lots. It is, it's very minuscule. But um, all of that, this is what happened. Okay, again, the expenditures, except for in FY21, where it dropped 30 million, it just keeps going up. And I asked in our budget meeting last week, why is uh, fiscal year 2028 so high, right? And you see that how it jumps up in fiscal year 28? Why did you project it that way? <coughs> and the answer was, because that's when we will have the new automated train control system online up and running. And I said, really, in fiscal year 28? I had just asked this question of the people in charge of the project the week before, and they said, we can't even put a date on the completion now because it's so far out into 2030. So this is how really dis you know, disjointed the projections are and the numbers you get as the public. My role, I believe, as a, as a finance person should be to try to put the real stuff out to the public. And it is really angering some people at BART. So this next slide, it's the same slide I just showed you, 
except that I added two things. This lighter red color <coughs> is the expenditures for debt service and for some other allocations that we do to reserve accounts, like we have a pension section 115 trust account that we had agreed to put $10 million per year into to start to address the unfunded pension liabilities. By the way, that was my initiative in 2018, but they didn't really take my advice in 2018 because what I told them then was, you need to pay down the layers of the unfunded liabilities. I had just rolled off of the Contra Costa County Pension Board. I know a little bit about this stuff, okay? So I said, well, you need to start paying down the layers because at minimum, you will save 7% per year in interest cost by paying down the debt that you owe to the pension system, okay? Well, they brought in their actuaries and, they, and, and got a hold of somebody who sells the Section 115 trust vehicle. And they convinced Bart, no, you don't want to pay down those layers. You want to just take and allocate money each year into this new trust plan, okay? That trust plan, four years in, year to date, has lost 5%, okay? Whereas we would have recaptured seven and a quarter or 7% on paying down the layers, but that's what we got. Anyway, back to this. So these are debt service and allocations, and the light green that I've added in here is the traditional taxpayer revenue. Sales tax, property tax, you know, when BART began, it had a half a cent sales tax approved by the voters, and we've been paying it ever since, right? These were the traditional taxpayer subsidies, and in 2019, before the pandemic hit, this actually is a net wash, right? This is what we brought in and this is what we sent out. Here's what happened as we went through time, 2020, the pandemic, down to 21, and this is all the way out. Those projections at the end, the, the green, the light green gets bigger because BART is continuing to project that sales tax will continue to increase and increase and increase the sales tax revenue. Well, if you pay attention to what's going on in San Francisco, I actually differ with that projection, but you know, it's, it's 2028, so whatever. Um, so then I did this, took that slide, and I added one thing to it, and it's this yellow area. This is the federal subs, they called it COVID subsidies, okay? It was the CARES Act, the ARPA, and the CRIS Acts. Three acts of federal subsidies to transit that filled this valley of deficits, okay? <coughs> right here, this yellow box, federal subsidies run out right here in fiscal year 25. We project this will be a $93 million deficit. My board just passed a two-year budget with a $93 million structural deficit in included in it, okay? Um, the rest, so, so all the stuff you're hearing in the news about the fiscal cliff and the, the doom loop and uh, they got a whole bunch of names for, you know, the, the Armageddon that's coming for BART, this is what they're talking about. This is where the <coughs> subsidies, the federal subsidies run out. Now, last night, the state uh, uh, announced that the new budget will include $1.1 billion for transit to help fill this problem right here, okay? BART has been out asking for $5 billion. Uh, they announced that they, they have $1 billion to spare at the state. And so you might wonder, you know, because I've got projections and these deficits in here, uh, 2026 is 330 million dollars okay in one year and then I think it goes to like 310 and then it goes way up in 2028 the deficits keep getting bigger these are structural deficits they aren't going to go away so there's only two answers more revenue less spending now I've been out arguing for the fact that I know you cannot completely cut $330 million out of BART's budget and expect to run, you know, even close to the service you're running, but shouldn't we at least be trying to cut some of the expenses? And I've argued this now, um, my board has had three opportunities to 
uh, where I have basically put it in front of them in public meetings and made them vote. Uh, it happened the first time on May 11th where uh, a straw poll was taken and I had asked previous to that meeting for staff to come back to us and just give us their best suggestions on how this budget could the operating expenses, that's these dark red bars, how could that be cut by 10%? What would that look like? What, what are your best ideas, right? They come back, we have another meeting on May 11th, another budget meeting, and I said, so, you know, I, I asked for this, um, did any of you do anything? <laughs> and the answer was from the general manager, took the microphone, I have this all on video, it's all over Twitter, uh, took the microphone and said, Director Allen, this board did not vote to direct the staff to come back with any recommendations for cuts. That was the answer. And so there was a lot to this meeting. You can watch it. It's online if you want. You know, can't sleep one night. But um, <laughs> it's about 45 minutes long. Um, Ultimately, at the end of the meeting, I got them to admit that, number one, all of our budget discussions had been agendized for information only. And what that means under the Brown Act is the board couldn't have passed a motion to direct anybody to do anything because you can't do that on an information only item. Okay, so I was attempting to try to understand <coughs> how can I actually propose a change to the budget. I'm a director and I can't propose a change to the budget that staff developed. And ultimately what they said in, on the 11th was, you'll have to propose your changes at the final vote on June 8th when we vote on the, bu the final budget. I said, okay, that's what I thought, right? And sure enough, when I got to June 8th last week, I proposed a substitute motion, and I said two things. I wanted the $93 million deficit, which is just a tad over 10%. I want that $93 million to reduce operating expenses, and I want a two-year balanced budget, because I am not going to vote for a, structure, a budget that includes a structural deficit, okay? And the second part of my motion was, I would like the Link 21 expenditures that are programmed for 2024 to be reprogrammed to the Fairgate replacement project, which is underway and in design, so that we could expedite the replacement of the fare gates and address the fare evasion that's going on in the system. And it has a whole bunch of impacts uh, on other things. Okay, sorry. So my motion was, my motion was defeated on a 6-3 vote, okay? But before my motion got a vote, my colleague Liz Ames, who Liz Ames and I work together often, she proposed a substitute motion to mine and said, I'm willing to take the 93 million and reduce operating expenses over two years. So split it 46 and a half between 24 and 25. I seconded her motion and I said, okay, I'm, I'm willing to go for that. And she included the fair gates and she included two other studies that she wanted done. That lost <coughs> a seven to vote before we went to my motion and it lost on a 6-3 vote, okay? So this board, six directors voted twice in one meeting to oppose cutting the expenditures of the system. Mm -hmm. And they did a straw poll vote on May 11th where six of them voted again. Actually, some of them were really comical and they said, absolutely not. I'm like, really? That's your answer when I say you should cut your budget? Absolutely not. But they did. Okay, so that's the budget story. You're hearing a lot about this. The money, the billion dollars that came in last night, and you're seeing news on this. Uh, it's, it's really going to, to fill this here. But, but what's, what happens then? Right? That's not enough. I mean, the billion dollars is split among all California transit agencies, and we might see 300 million of that, and it might fill one year. What are you going to do the next year? And the next year, and the next year, well, that's where they're going to come and put it on the ballot. 
and they're coming after a 2026 ballot measure to increase that half a cent sales tax, probably it will be a sales tax measure, um, to increase that half a cent sales tax to generate permanent revenue to fill these deficits for the rest of time until they run out again. <laughs> okay. This, I'm going to kind of skip over this. These were the planning uh, charts that were given to us throughout COVID three years in a row. And, and every year they gave us these three cases of ridership return, right? And this is the base, the, the lower end case, the base case, and the, the upside case. And we watched these charts continually be wrong for three years. This is the latest chart, and we are already below this bottom line. So um, there you go. Their, their projections are often wrong. Um, but here's the interesting thing. You know, Bart likes to blame COVID and the pandemic. And you'll hear them often say, we can't, we, we can't control the pandemic destroyed our ridership. There's nothing we could have done about it. But actually, Bart is way down here with respect to the return of ridership post-pandemic. And that has everything to do with San Francisco and the conditions there, and it has everything to do with the conditions you see on the train, right? And this is the part that you don't hear anything from BART on this, but believe me, I hear it from writers every day, the ones who are writing. So there's a menu for fiscal stability. We can increase ridership revenue, raise fares, parking fees, we just did both of those. Um, and we can look for more riders. We can increase other operating revenues. We have fiber optic cable being laid. We have transit-oriented development. We have Wi-Fi. I can tell you that these things are not producing a whole lot of revenue, um, though they, they mention them often. We can increase taxpayer subsidies. That's really the goal, is number three. That's Bart's goal. Um, and then we can cut service to cut operating expenses. My compromise on this one is we should be looking at not at underperforming lines, underperforming times, mm -hmm. and we certainly don't need to run BART until 3 a.m., which is what they, they would all love to do, right? <laughs> okay. So, uh, and then we can return to the basic mission, and that's focus on running good transit, and that really comes down to the public safety area. So my areas of focus for BART are two right now. It's, it's the, customer, uh, the customer focus. How do we get people to want to return to BART? And there have been plenty of surveys on this. And I have spent seven years listening to people text me, call me, message me, you know, email me, whatever, and tell me what they experience on the trains. So by the way, when we get to Q&A, you can't tell me any story about your ride on BART that will surprise me. So um, I heard it all. Okay. And then operational efficiency, because I really believe we have to focus on that to convince the taxpayers that BART, BART is worth saving. So the, this has been a constant challenge. Even before the pandemic, it is improving the writer experience, right? And it wasn't really fantastic before the pandemic, but the writers that I hear from say it's gotten far worse. Um, I know when I ride, which isn't every day, I, I encounter all the things people tell me about too. I even have photos. <laughs> um, but, but look, the customer, what will bring them back? And so I kind of boiled it down to this. To get riders on BART, first of all, you have to have the pool of people who need it. Okay? They have to have somewhere that they need to go that BART goes to or goes close to, that they can get to easily on BART. And then, once you have that pool of people, you have an overlapping pool of of those people who wants it, right? And this pot of people, the people who need BART, has shrunk drastically through no fault of BART, okay? These, this is from external factors. BART cannot control this. And it has to do with our economic recovery in the Bay Area, particularly San Francisco, and that question of where is the workplace, right? So many people are working from home or they're working partly from home. And does BART go where I need it to go? But once we have this pool of people, 
do they want it? Okay, and that's where it comes down to everything that Bart does can impact this. And it is the writer's satisfaction, the reliability and the efficiency. Bart has struggled terribly with these new trains and the reliability of them. Uh, and the affordability, <coughs> errors just went up again. And the clean environment, but most importantly, top of every survey, do I feel safe? Okay, and so, this is why they will ride. That's why they will ride again, right? Because once a person has a bad experience in any of these areas, that question of do they want to do it again is really questionable. So we get, then we get into the, the rider experience, the quality of life issues. And these things have plagued BART since when I started in January 2017. Okay. It's the homelessness, the panhandling, the cleanliness, the crime, the drug use. Mark touched on a lot of these, and here's some of my own photos that I've taken throughout my rides on BART. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I, I can tell you that on that, that panhandling issue, because Mark made, made, made a story out of that, in 2018, I had a news reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle I was doing an interview on something and I mentioned the panhandling and all these things and had a news reporter challenge me and say, are you going to propose that we ban panhandling on BART? I said, oh, I, I don't know, you think I should? And, and this reporter said, yeah, you should. And I said, okay, maybe I will. She went out and wrote her story and told everybody in San Francisco Chronicle that I was going to ban panhandling. <laughs> so, it was thrown down, and I said, okay, that's not a bad idea. I have a consultant, and he goes, yeah, I like it. So, I set out to ban panhandling, and long story short, in the summer of 2019, came to a vote on this board, and it was defeated on a 5-4 vote, <laughs> banning panhandling. That, folks, is the problem. That's why I mentioned these directors <coughs> are elected, okay? We could have eliminated one source of, of many sources of angst of our writers by, by banning panhandling and, and giving a little bit of, you know, the writers could have pointed to that sign on the train and said, you know, you're not supposed to be panhandling here, right? Like, you're not supposed to be smoking here or whatever. We also could have allowed our police department to address the issue for the repeat offenders, okay? We took a hard pass on it. So, fair evasion. I came in the door screaming, <coughs> fair gates, replace the fair gates, okay? Mm -hmm. Every BART writer for 20 years knew the problems at the fair gates, right? And um, I actually did get some data put together uh, I got the police department to start collecting data in 2019, May of 2019. Uh, I got the police department to add a box to their reports that said, yes or no, did the person that they detained have a, a valid proof of payment? Okay. It wasn't easy. I went through three police chiefs and I finally got them to do it with working with the POA. And in November, we looked at six months of data and we found that over 81% of the people arrested in the BART system by BART police had not paid a fare. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's just the people arrested. <laughs> okay. So um, BART still refuses to release that data, by the way. Um, they, they will not release that data to the public. And in <coughs> fact, I have five directors. <coughs> who have continuously opposed police activity in fair evasion control. There is a bill running through the, the legislature right now, it's in the Senate committees, AB 819, to completely eliminate the misdemeanor charge of fair evasion on your third offense. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's not a misdemeanor until your third offense, and my fellow directors are looking to eliminate that. So what do we do <coughs> on fair evasion? You know, there's a lot of station hardening stuff. We had a lot of holes in the system. We have since addressed uh, the, the locking screen gates, though there's now a station agent problem with that. 
Um, we do have fair inspectors now. The police department can still issue citations. We just don't have enough of them. We have raised the railings. We have enclosed many of the elevators. Um, Walnut Creek recently got closed off. Um, Con uh, Concord was the first one. It's because I demanded it. It was my project. And I said, you'll do my station first. <laughs> um, and replacing fare gates are in design. We awarded a contract for an off-the-shelf fare gate. <coughs> There's still design criteria. We will begin installing those in December, I am told. And the current plan is that it won't be complete until 26. My current plan is to make that December of 2024 uh, when I leave office. So. <laughs> um, reducing fare evasion, look, we know when crime goes down, the revenues go up, the cleanliness improves, and the rider satisfaction improves. Before the pandemic, it was estimated 25 to 55 million in annual lost revenue. 25 was Bart's estimate, 55 was mine. I did my own analysis. I've done my own analysis <coughs> since the pandemic. And um, really the question becomes, what is the rate of ferry evasion? And everyone who rides tells me it's gone up, but again, Bart will not study it. So um, I still say that even after the pandemic, we are at least losing 30 million a year. So then, you know, the other issue that has plagued BART for decades really has been addressing homelessness. It's been there forever. It's just far worse now, but it's far worse everywhere now, not just at BART, right? And so then, um, so there are some things going on. There's a strategic homeless action plan with regional coordination. So there are some things happening, but at the end of the day, we have a board that will not actually escort people out of the system when they're found not paying a fare. And most of your homeless people have not paid a fare. So um, cleaner trains, this is the area where there's great news, I believe. I see it, other writers are seeing it, that at least the trains are cleaner now, right? And that was a result of doubling the amount of money and effort we were putting into cleaning the trains. And that's, that was like one of the good things that COVID brought us, right? Everything got cleaner. <laughs> so um, operational efficiency initiatives, there's a, a list of them here, financial structure reorganization. That's actually one of my projects that's going on now. We have a committee and, you know, we'll see where that ends. Uh, mergers of construction operations. This was a really great thing that happened uh, recently is we merged two departments. Uh, we used to have a maintenance construction department and a, uh, the track and, and large asset construction department and we've now merged them, which made a ton of sense. Uh, so there, there are some things moving forward at BART. Uh, technology is improving. Um, we're still working on talent acquisition. Uh, the Office of the BART Inspector General um, Steve Glazer gets credit for, for putting the bill forward for that, but it was my meeting in Steve Glazer's office where we discussed the problems I was encountering in 2018 at BART and trying to just get information out of my own agency that I sat on the board of. And he's the one that looked at me and said, what do you think about an inspector general? And I said, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so he went out and he made it happen legislatively. It's been a rocky road. We had a great inspector general. I worked hard in that first year to develop the office and hire the person, develop the job description. Um, she unfortunately uh, was not treated very well, and I agree <laughs> with everything that you've read about this situation. Um, the BART Audit Committee uh, was something I attempted to do in 2017 when I first got there. Of course, I started my career as an auditor. Why isn't there an audit committee on an agency that spends $2.5 billion per year? And um, I was met with a hard no in 2018. And then um, when we got the Inspector General, I sat down with her one day and, and I said to her, I said, you know, there really needs to be an audit committee here. And she said, yeah, I noticed that we don't have an audit committee. How do we, let's, let's do that, right? And I said, well, here's how you do it. You go to Duffin Dufty, <coughs> and, who was the president of the board at the time and a former San Francisco supervisor. He is the guy who runs BART, okay? 
you go to Bevan Dufty and you propose it to him, you, you IG, you pitch it to him and you make it his idea, let him propose it, and I'll just go, oh, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> and that is what happened, and it, and it passed when we got an audit committee and a 9-0 vote. So if that doesn't tell you something about the politics <coughs> of this board, <laughs> there it is. Okay? Um, and then accountability and transparency to the public and taxpayers, really, that, that's what I went there to do, right? I'm not a transit activist. I love transit, and I believe it's, it's needed and it's essential. <coughs> but I didn't go in as a transit activist. I went in as a good governance activist and to provide what we need with good governance. So um, my opinion piece this morning, BART bailout should come with state oversight and other conditions. Here were the things I said, needs a state appointed oversight commission, just like school districts get when they are bankrupt. Uh, we need to renegotiate the labor contracts. This board that I sit on took three hard passes on that in the last three years. Um, and then we need to limit the campaign contributions from BART unions and vendors. And we need to move the Office of Inspector General now uh, outside of BART. It truly isn't independent when it's sitting inside of BART headquarters and, and, and being influenced by BART management. So um, anyway, you can look for that. That's it. Sorry that was uh, longer than you probably uh, wanted. But if you need to contact me, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Far too often, I have a website, <laughs> and uh, this is actually my email is Deborah at fixourbart, D E B O R A, no H, 